Hey everybody, Aaron here, and it's time for another edition of E-Waste Wednesday. If you put those initials together, you come up with ooh. Hi everyone, welcome to L. I kind of like that because in the case of this monitor, as you can see, sometimes it does mean ew. I get some pretty nasty stuff at e-waste, but it turns out Wednesday for me is a good day to go uh, take a look at what's there and bring back anything I find interesting. So let's go ahead and take a look at what I found this week, starting off with this Packard Bell monitor. So this monitor is in pretty good shape, although it is a little bit yellow. And notice down here on the bottom, we have the old style Packard Bell logo, which tells me that this monitor probably came from the early 90s. It looks much different than the Packard Bell logo that they adopted shortly after this when they started selling machines that would be in every store and seemingly every circular that got dropped off at my doorstep in the late 90s. And as you can see here, it matches the logo on this Packard Bell laptop that I got, which is from 1991 as well. I did a whole interesting repair video on this a while back, so if you want to watch that, I will link to it below and above. And on the front panel here, we have controls for horizontal width, vertical width, vertical positioning, brightness, and contrast, as well as the power button. Now looking at the back, we can see on the label here that this came from Packard Bell of Chatsworth, California. And we can see the model number listed here. Not a whole lot of other useful information on the label, except that it does support dual voltage in case you wanted to ship this monitor overseas. And down here we have an interesting panel that looks a bit homemade, although I think this is the way it came from the factory. It has the voltage adjustment, but it also has different knobs to adjust the horizontal phase depending on what resolution you were running. And this actually supports three different resolutions because it is an extended VGA compatible monitor. It's not just SVGA, so that means it supports standard VGA, which is 640 by 480. It also supports 800 by 600, and it even supports 1024 by 768, which was a fairly high resolution for the time, although it only supports that in interlace mode. Also interesting here, if you are running an 800 by 600, it has a sub-phase adjustment. So not sure exactly why they needed the sub-phase adjustment, but it's here if you need to adjust the positioning on your screen to a high degree. So if I fire up this Packard Bell laptop and hit the external display key here at the top, you can see it does show up just fine, although the color looks a little wonky. We'll take a look at this in just a minute. But otherwise, the text is sharp, it's clear. Um, there doesn't seem to be any stretching of the image, so, so far, so good. And firing up Check It, things seem to look pretty good here, but remember, Check It has a blue screen to start with, so that doesn't tell us too much about the other colors that this monitor supports. Looking at the configuration, I just wanted to check and make sure what uh, version of VGA we're using here, and it does say that this adapter supports standard VGA, so that's good. When we get into the graphics test though, things look pretty good in terms of different modes and resolutions. In terms of sizes, things are pretty clear, but when we get to the colors and look at the red palette, that's when things start to go awry. You can see it looks like red is missing altogether. In fact, this looks a bit like a monochrome monitor on this particular screen. And when we get to the color purity test, sure enough, there is no red whatsoever represented coming off of this monitor. So I think this will probably have to go into the repair backlog and I'll make a video about repairing this monitor and see if we can get that red color back because it does look pretty good for a monitor of this age. Now I usually wait till the end and kind of surprise people with the price that I paid, but I think throughout this video, I'll just tell you what the prices I paid as I go through. And in this case, for this particular monitor, I paid $5. So if I can repair it and get it working, then this was a pretty good buy, I'd say. Now, the next thing I found was what's in this container here, and it is an Atari 2600. Now I have plenty of Atari 2600s uh, across the line, all the way from a heavy sixer up to uh, Atari Junior, but I needed a couple extra so that I could mod them for some upcoming videos. So at the price that I got this thing for, it was well worth picking up. And luckily this thing came with just about everything you would find in a typical Atari setup from the switch box to the joysticks to the paddles, even the power adapter was included and some other random cables as well. Anybody need some speaker wire? 
Unfortunately, it was all in a big jumble of mixed up wires, so it took me exactly five minutes to unsort this mess and get everything torn apart into their individual components and ready for testing. I'll be using my pink 80 Sony Trinitron TV for this since I know it has a nice clean picture. And I thought I would try using the switcher. I almost always just throw these out, but just for fun, I thought I would plug it in and see if it would work going through the switch box. Now, normally I don't recommend this. I usually recommend using these RCA to coaxial adapters that you can get very readily on Amazon or other places on the internet. And they work great for switching the signal from one of these classic Atari 2600s to the cable TV input on the back of your TV. The next thing I wanted to do was test out the power supply. The power supply for the Atari 2600 is in this eighth inch plug, similar to the one that you would plug into your phone to listen to music. Well, that is if your phone has a headphone jack anymore. However, when I measured this power supply, it came up with basically nothing. This was a completely dead power supply. So luckily I've got a few more sitting around. So I just grabbed another one and used that instead. When I was looking at this, I noticed that someone had left the plastic on top of the label again. So I guess we have to do this. Cue the music. Now the only question was, what game was I going to use to test out this Atari 2600? Well, I just happened to pick up a box of random Atari cartridges, not from eWaste, but here's Stargate. That's a great game. So let's plug it in and see if it works. After checking the TV to make sure I was on the right channel, channel three in this case, I went ahead and turned it on and uh oh, that doesn't look right. So I flipped it over to make sure that I was actually on channel three. I was set for the right channel on the Atari and I was. So then it got me thinking that probably this switch box was out of commission after so many years. So I swapped out the switch box for the little adapter I showed earlier. And after I hit reset on the Atari, there we go. Stargate's working great now. Well, pretty much. There is a little bit of interference on the screen, which is caused by maybe some fraying or something at the end of the RCA cable. Uh, but I can patch that up later, as long as I can get it into a good position so I can see what's going on. That'll work for now. Stargate is a great game that was an arcade clone of Defender, essentially, and then it got ported over to Atari and other systems, and it just plays really well. The colors are fantastic here, so I don't think there's a whole lot actually wrong with this Atari or anything that is in need of a tune-up or anything. And uh, this brought back a lot of muscle memory because I played the heck out of this game when I was a kid. And uh, what fun. This just looks great, and playing on the real system is amazing. So as I mentioned, I got this for a pretty good price. So the system, including all of the controllers and the power adapter, which was unfortunately not working, cost me $20 at eWay. So I was pretty happy with that purchase and I'll be including this on some upcoming episodes. So before I get to the last eWaste Wednesday item, I wanted to give kind of an honorable mention, I guess, to this Diamond Multimedia card. Now this is an AGP card and some might think this is a little bit newer than what I normally show on the channel, and that's true, but I have been collecting some of these AGP cards and other, other cards because they're cheap right now. I got this card for $5, and my thinking is, is that, you know, if I start collecting this stuff now and throw it in a bin, doesn't take up much space, then when I, at some point down the years, maybe 10 years from now or something, when I get around to this on the channel, I'll have the card and I'll be all ready to go. Last but not least on this e-waste Wednesday is a wise terminal. I've been looking for a wise terminal for a long time now. And so when I saw one at e-waste and they told me that the keyboard wasn't working, why well, I was certainly intrigued to see if I could take it home and fix it up. Now, the first thing I looked for was to see if there was any burn in on the front of the screen. And there was a slight amount, although not too much. I definitely want to take a look at this keyboard and also here's the cable that connects the keyboard to the terminal and you can see there's something going on here at this point in the keyboard cable itself. There are a limited number of exterior controls on this thing. There's a slider for contrast, a slider for brightness, and then one for the power itself. Taking a look at the back of the unit, we can see the WISE Technology logo, San Jose, California. 
there's the power input. There's also a port that's labeled modem and then another one that's labeled aux or auxiliary. Those are no doubt serial ports and the port for the keyboard to plug in. And up here we can see the model number. This is a WY-55. I was getting ready to do a continuity test on this cable when I noticed that actually this wasn't tape or even a kink in the cable. It was just the plastic left over from the tag that would have been on this when it was brand new. So I got out my scissors and cut this thing off and yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with this cable at all. Perhaps what happened was when the people that originally looked at this terminal, they may not have realized that the terminal won't return any characters unless it's hooked up in either half duplex mode or connected to an actual computer at the end of the serial cable to echo back those characters. So maybe they were trying characters and they just didn't see anything coming back. So they assumed that the keyboard wasn't working. We'll have to try that out and see if it actually is working. Before I turn this on, I wanted to check out the key switches. So I pulled off a couple of keys and unfortunately, this is a rubber dome keyboard, but boy, it sure does feel nice, especially given how many hours this thing must have seen in use. All right, let's turn it on and see what happens. Now, I didn't notice a picture at first and I went ahead and turned down the brightness and contrast just in case there was something out on the horizontal or vertical that would have caused a bright stripe across the screen because that's not good. It could be repaired, but it could also burn in a stripe either vertically or horizontally and that wouldn't be good. So the other thing I noticed is that it had a ringing. There was this ringing that was occurring not at the normal frequency that I expected, but around 1300 Hertz and not sure if that perhaps is a ringing capacitor on the inside or what, but yeah, it definitely shows up on the Spectrum Analysis app here. Upon turning up the contrast and the brightness slowly, I noticed that there was a beautiful green screen. Look at this. So the terminal is actually working and we have a blinking cursor. After doing a bit of research, I found out that I could hit Shift and Setup and that would take me into the terminal menu. And there are a lot of settings in here you can configure. Just look at the number of personalities this terminal can have. Not only the wise different terminals that were available at the time, but standard PC terminal, uh, things like VT100, which we'll use a little bit later on. So just lots and lots of settings that you can change. And the beauty is they're all done in software. So you don't have to change any dip switches. In my case, I wanted to set this thing for half duplex mode. That will allow me to see what I'm typing on the screen. So I set that for half duplex and save my settings. And as soon as I did that, the keyboard sprang to life. All of the keys were working. I tested them all out, no issues whatsoever. This terminal has an optional beep that sounds every time you press a key. And personally, I kind of like that, so I left that on. Now it appears this terminal is fully functional, but that's not good enough. I actually need to test this out connected to a live system and see if I can enter commands and get a prompt and all of those things that you would expect. So I went out and found this Raspberry Pi and hooked up a serial to USB connector. These can be easily found on Amazon and other places even still. And then I also needed a null modem cable. This will allow the various signals to pass through in the correct orientation uh, so that the terminal can talk to the serial adapter. In the terminal settings itself, I went ahead and set the terminal emulation mode for VT100 as that is very standard and should be easily supported by Linux running on the Raspberry Pi. I also made sure that my communication protocol was set to eight, none, and one. On the Raspberry Pi, it's pretty simple to allow connections over the USB ports. You just have to run these two commands, which will start the Raspberry Pi listening on these ports. And it should work fine as long as you're not trying to support some weird terminal or strange ANSI characters back from our BBS days. So with everything hooked up, all there was to do was to power on the Raspberry Pi. And there we go. We're getting a login prompt for the Raspberry Pi. I can go ahead and type in my username and password and I'll get to my user prompt. I had no issues using this terminal at all with the Raspberry Pi. And you can see just how crisp and sharp this terminal is. So it's really still in very good shape. No issues here. I won't have to do any repair. By the way, 
you might be interested to know that you can actually run a browser on this terminal. Lynx is a text-based browser for Linux and Unix type systems, and you can just type Lynx in here and start browsing the web. To start with, let's go ahead and see what Google looks like. And it does ask me for quite a few cookies. I'm just gonna go ahead and allow those for now. And there we go. Here's the menu up at the top. I can tab down here or arrow down over to the uh, underscore area here and type in a prompt like Retro Hack Shack. And here are the results. The very first at the top of the list here is the Retro Hack Shack YouTube page. And then down beneath that, then the second listing is my shop over at retrohackshack.com slash shop. So you can go over there and shop for all your retro computer mods. Let's just go ahead and see what the Retro Hack Shack shop looks like on a text-based browser. And here we are at the Retro Hack Shack shop homepage. Uh, we've got the menu listed here at the top. And if we scroll down just a little bit, we'll see some of the products that I offer on the Retro Hack Shack shop. So the Amiga uh, to PC floppy drive adapter, the ever popular RGB to HDMI board that I sell and all the different cards and boards and supporting materials there. So yeah, it is possible to surf the web even on a WISE terminal from the late 80s and early 90s. And this terminal only cost me $20, so I can't complain at all about that. And I also did go to my YouTube page here. You can see it up here. It says Retro Hack Shack, but there's literally no content that can be displayed on a text terminal in YouTube, apparently. So uh, it'd be kind of interesting if there would. I'd like to see one of my videos in text mode. That might be interesting. Uh, but in any case, uh, hopefully you enjoyed this quick look at some of the stuff I found at eWaste. Thanks as always to my patrons who have donated so generously. If you want to become a patron, you can find out how in just a minute in the credits. That's where all of my patrons' names will be listed. And be sure to follow me both on Instagram and Mastodon. Well, with that, I don't think there's anything left to say. So until next, blah, blah, blah. that's going to cover it for this episode. So until next time, thanks for watching. Patrons receive ad-free and early access to content after the episode commentary, and of course, your name in the credits. If you liked that episode, here's a few more you might enjoy, and I thank you for your support. End of line.